I'm Derek Bermel. I'm the uh, art artist in residence here at the Institute for Advanced Study. And um, another mic. Excellent. Then I'm giving that to you. Now we're all even. You can all chime in. You can just pass it. Oh, OK. <laughs> He's going to be hands free. Uh, so I'm, I'm the artist in residence here at the Institute for Advanced Study, for those of you who do not know. And, and people will be wandering in, trickling in, as it were, uh, during this talk. So, you know, just it's, it's fairly open-ended. Uh, if you want to come closer, feel free to come closer. Don't be shy. Uh, but if you don't, that's okay. We're not offended. Um, this concert is the Mallet Madness concert. And it, therefore, it features uh, several different Mallet performers. And you can see up here on stage, we have our um, panoply of instruments. Um, here we have the, the marimba, vibraphone. Uh, I should say five octave marimba, which is slightly different. And here we have a vibraphone, a really large vibraphone as well. And then we, here we have uh, the jill, which is uh, the Dagara jill from uh, West Africa. So we have three wonderful performers tonight. And, um, and we have the composer of one of the uh, pieces here. So we've got it all. Uh, I just wanted to start by maybe asking the uh, e each one of these players uh, how they got started doing what they do and why they chose, whoa, okay, I guess that was the right question. Why they chose, uh, yeah, maybe bring it down a little, thanks. No, or, bring, no, us down. <laughs> bring us down a little. Uh, and, uh, and, and how, how uh, they got involved in, uh, in playing a mallet instrument, which is, you know, maybe a slightly unusual choice. Uh, so uh, why don't we start with Lisa, who's our first uh, soloist. Um, is this on? Can I have, okay. Um, I actually didn't start out on mallet instruments. I actually started out on snare drum, believe it or not. Um, and I started out playing snare drum when I was seven. And from there, I started playing drum kit. And then I began playing keyboard instruments later on um, because it was, of course, part of the percussion family. And I kind of took the classical solo route, if you would. Um, and so I actually started playing the xylophone, which is the one instrument you don't actually see up here, is a xylophone, um, which is a smaller wooden keyboard instrument. And I began learning melodies and whatnot on xylophone instruments, and then I learned basic piano, and then I went from that to learning um, four mallet marimba, which is what you'll hear me play tonight. Let's say something about four mallets, as opposed to, most people have probably assumed that you play with two mallets, but, but you're gonna see a lot of four mallet playing tonight. Right, so um, we, we begin learning normally with just two mallets, um, and then there's a there are many different techniques that you can do using four mallets. And you'll see myself and also Joe play with four mallets tonight. And I play a technique called um, Stevens technique where um, the grip, I actually hold um, the sticks in between three or two of, two of my fingers. And um, it's, a, it's a really intricate type of technique. There are other techniques, cross grip, Musser, Burton. Um, I won't get into the details of that. But the, the one that I have learned is a really technical one that allows you to get really large intervals on the instrument and also have a lot of finger control, which you'll see some of the, the pieces that I'm learning takes a lot of finger control uh, to get the notes even and smooth. Yeah, and a large interval, uh, meaning interval between two notes, is, uh, is something that you know, has a very different meaning on a mallet instrument than on a, on a piano. And, uh, because obviously the notes are spaced so much farther apart that you really have to worry about what you're writing if you're a composer and you want, you want to write something specific for a mallet instrument. It's not the same as just writing for piano where you, know, you can fit an octave or even more in, your, in, your, in one hand. Um, you know, it becomes difficult technically to, to do that. So maybe Paul will speak a little bit about the, the idea of a, a, a non-mallet person to writing for a mallet instrument. But um, Joe, can you tell us you know, something about what made your choice? Well, I, I play actually play the same same grip that Elisa was talking about, the, the Stevens grip. And I, I would always say to my, my students and at master classes, I would always say, 
I play like a version, a bastardization of Steven's grip, and I, and, I, and I would always say if Lee was here, he would just roll his eyes at how I've screwed up his grip. And I was doing a, I was doing a master class at the Royal Academy of Music in London, and I said exactly that. I said, you know, I play a version, of like a bastardization of Steven's grip, but if Lee were here, and I looked up and Lee was standing in the back of the room, and, it, and he just like comedically you know, rolled his eyes, and I went, see, I knew it. <laughs> Um, the, the, the grip thing, um, just I'll, I'll go into my little story by way of this. The, the, the grip thing is, is, is very interesting because it's whatever, the end, and the end justifies the means. However you get the music out is really what it's all about. And um, myself as a jazz musician, it really is about how you express yourself, whether it's with one mallet or with six mallets. It's about, it's about expressing your humanity through the music and however you, whatever grip you use, there seems to be a, a huge thing among mallet players about what grip you play. Whether there's a whole thing in the jazz community about what grip swings. Because jazz is all about swinging and groove and how the music makes you feel in your body and, and that the, the, the notion that a grip can swing or not swing is ludicrous. The human being swings or doesn't swing, you know, so, um, so there. Um, I started playing the vibes because my mother wanted me to play the glockenspiel in the marching band. And she was rather sadistic. Because the, 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 the way I see it, the, there's a hierarchy in high school. And the hierarchy kind of goes, you know, the jocks at the top. And then the cool kids, you know, the freaks, the heads, the guys, the ones that are getting high and know what's going on and listening to the hippest music. And then there are like the, the smart, smart ones, the really smart ones. And then there's... And then there's, you know, somewhere down there, there's the nerds. And then under, under the nerds, there's the glockenspiel player in the marching band. <laughs> and the glockenspiel player in the marching band is the one he'd get beaten up by the nerds after school, okay? So my mother wanted me to play the glockenspiel, sadist that she was. And um, she came into my room one day. I, I had been playing drums and piano at that, at that point. And, uh, and she came into my room and said, Joe, there's an ad in the, in the, in the want ads for a, for a used for a vibraphone, something called a vibraphone. That's, that's sort of like a glockenspiel, isn't it? And she, and she, and she got me this, this Genco vibraphone for $200. And if there, was an, if there had been an ad in the newspaper that day for a, for a glockenspiel, I would be a jazz glockenspiel player today. So oh, thank, thank goodness, yeah. thank goodness that, that didn't happen. Um, I play the vibes because I started playing drums and I was always, but I was always going to melody. I was always going, I was always, Picking, picking up melodies on the piano. And I started to, you know, to, to write music at a young age. And I, I wanted to play a melodic instrument, but I didn't want to play an instrument that carried the weight of history that the piano did. And I didn't want all that responsibility. And um, I, I, I really think the vibraphone was the, was, was, I really think it found me in a manner of speaking because I, I felt, I feel like I found my, found my voice, my actual, my, my reason for being in playing the vibraphone. I like to say that it's, it's um, uh, this just came out the other, recently in a radio inter interview I did for Vermont Public Radio, and he said, what's, what's your relationship to the vibes? And without thinking, I said, it's my, it's my best friend, my nemesis, my challenge, and my mirror. And, um, I, and it, it you know, continues uh, uh, to, to be that. And uh, it's, uh, it's, I'm very fortunate to have, it, to have uh, music in my life. The vibes is just a vehicle, so it's really more about language to me. It's more about vocabulary, syntax, language, the language of, of, of this American improvised music called jazz and how, how amazing it is that you, you can find your, with 12 notes in the chromatic scale, that one can find a completely unique way of expressing his or her humanity just by, by exploring the possibilities, you know? You know, I, that's, that's very beautiful. The, I, was, I was just thinking, Bernard was talking a little bit about, uh, you were talking about very youthful experiences, and uh, you talked yesterday about how you were actually, this goes back to how you came out of the womb. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate? Well, yeah, in, in my culture where um, uh, oral tradition is the form of education, so when uh, children are born, they are perceived with certain talents and skills. In my professional area as a musician, a jill player is born with birth signs. So I came out of my mother's womb like this. And this was a sign I would be a jill player. So when I was born, my father 
obviously um, was made to get me a miniature gel mallet so they can put it in my fingers and, and as I grow, I get connected to the instrument. In fact, my older brother was born like that and uh, the woman didn't notice it and when they go to bathe him, they forced his fingers opened and he is an adult now. These two fingers never comes up from both right and left. He can dance, he can sing, he can support you on the instrument, but you put him to play the jill, he sounds like the most worst person ever. <laughs> <laughs> so we all tease him how bad he is to play the instrument, but that the belief is that that uh, talent was forced out from his hands, and uh, he was made to go through certain rituals to acquaint himself to the music. So mentally he's connected, but physically he can't play. Uh. So when I was born, um, that warning really helped me, and uh, I was taken through the uh, traditional processes where my mother would tell me these stories. Um, when I was two years old, I could just walk to the instrument and pick up the mallets and start playing tunes that I've been hearing uh, from older players or uh, people sing around, and they would sing me a song and I'll just play what I hear. So playing the instrument was just like learning how to speak. I didn't have to go to a teacher to study from them. Um, the jill playing has its own techniques. It has two types of uh, grip. As my colleagues talked about, we have two traditional uh, techniques. You can put, it, put the mallet in between your fingers, and because the jill mallets are much heavier than a, a marimba or a vibraphone mallet, you put it in between your forefinger and your middle finger, that way you use, you're using your wrist very easily and you can swing your wrist up and down, sideways, very easily. Um, other players uh, can also hold a jill mallet as holding a drum set mallet, a drum set stick. And those uh, techniques are not conventional. So the Dagara people acquaint or associate those techniques to musicians who are not born with the techniques, but learn the music as they grow by observing and, and seeing other players. So those type of jill players tend to hold the stick this way. But I watching, I mean, grow, growing up from that tradition and watching talented and exceptional mallet players play the jill, some talented ones also are attuned to holding the mallet like this. And I cannot just do that. <laughs> Well, it seems like we're going to spend a lot today yeah. talking about the way you hold the mallet. Because <laughs> everybody's kind of I interested in it, whether they're pro or anti that. But I mean, I, I assume everybody's got to find their own way. I'm for holding the mallet. For holding the mallet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, you know, what's interesting is one thing about, uh, that I remember from my experience in Ghana, and I met Bernard 18 years ago in, uh, in, in Ghana. But one, one thing it just reminded me is that um, I did see very young players playing. You might laugh when he says he was playing when he was two years old, but I would see very young players, and I, I remember distinctly when I was learning that song, Kola Perbe, John Colino, oh, Kola Perbe, and, and, and they, were, they were practicing this tune, and the kid would only play maybe one note in the cycle. He would just wait, and he'd go, boom, 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 boom. When he got a little bit better, he would, boom, 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 boom. You know, and they would add one note to the cycle, and it was such an interesting way of learning, as opposed to the way we learn, which is we learn, you know, the notes in a row, you know, get all the notes at the right rhythm in a row. But they're learning, kind of, to insert a note in in the right place, and then insert more notes and more notes, and then and then and then eventually you get some somebody who becomes very virtuosic, and that's yeah, the, the stuff. Well, I want to ask just. So, not being a mallet player, what, what is your instrument? And, and Paul Lansky, by the way, is 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 a uh, professor of uh, composition at Princeton University, and so he's taught many many students over the years, and and, and obviously he's a very eminent composer himself. Um, your Lisa's playing one of your pieces today. What what you've written quite a bit for 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 percussion, and what, what what's your orientation to? Because you've also written a lot of electronic music, a lot of symphonic music. How do you approach this differently than than other instruments and other ways of making well, music? Well, uh, for a long time, starting in the early 70s, my main area of work was in electronic music. And it wasn't until the 80s or so, you know, 20, 25 years ago, that I started 
doing more active writing for instruments. And one of the earliest pieces I wrote was for marimba and ensemble. And um, somebody told me that what you had to do with marimba is pretend as if you were playing the piano with two fingers on each hand. So I sort of thought, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was used to writing for electronic media, so uh, I figured if I can write it, they can play it. And that turned out not to be the case. Um, <laughs> I wrote this piece, and it was really hard marimba part, and when they when we came to a recording session, they hired two marimba players to play the one part because it was so difficult. Then in the 90s, uh, my colleague Steve Mackey married a well-known marimba player, Nancy Zelsman, and she lived in town, and she got me to write for her ensemble for marimba and violin. And that was really an education. I would go to Nancy's house and show her what I had written, and uh, I'd go home, throw out what I had written, and write some more. Mm. Uh, and then finally, I wrote a, a piece called Three Moves for Marimbo, which is is one of the, I don't know, it's one of the hardest marimba pieces. And it's not hard because it's a hard marimba piece, it's, it's hard because, because it's, in a sense, it's not that well written for the instrument. Like, it sounds great when a marimba player really plays it. But, uh, so I was learning slowly, and then a couple of years ago I wrote the set of six etudes, six preludes for uh, a consortium of marimba players. So writing for marimba has really been an education. It's a lot, uh, it sort of reminds me um, of what young composers should learn. I think young composers probably should learn, begin by writing for marimba because it's an instrument where you really have to guide, the composer has to be guided by a lot of very difficult things that the player has to go through. The composer really has to choreograph the motion of the player. And uh, it's a real education in writing for instruments. So uh, I love writing for marimba. It's, it's a fascinating instrument to write for. The, um, the five octave marimba has got a very peculiar timbre in the low register. It's got a very fifth, loud fifth harmonic. Yeah, so you hear, an oct you hear two octaves and a major third every time you play a low note on the bottom of the marimba, and so it's got a really peculiar acoustic uh, ring to it. And um, it's a fascinating combination of a percussion instrument and a keyboard instrument. Uh, it really uh, sort of, it, you, you hear percussive sounds and you hear uh, sort of clear pitch sounds, but it's, an, it's a wonderful mixture of all kinds of things, and it's been a total education for me. This, this is, it's, it's fascinating because tonight you're going to hear, uh, you know, the, the ancestor, in a way, of these instruments. And, uh, I mean, it's not the ancestor, but there were many, many African traditions of marimba playing, uh, and, and, or xylophone playing, I should say, and, th and this is one of them. But, uh, but I certainly, do you, do you have a sense, Bernard, of how old this tradition is? And then I'm, I'm just curious, you know, maybe we can also open it up. For, for um, this this is a generation, I mean, that goes beyond humanity. Because uh, as people migrate and people associate and assembly together, they experiment uh, their musical instrumentation using n materials in nature. Um, I want to ask my Jill father, I call him my instruments, uh, associated with uh, the environment, the forest, the lands, the spirit of the land. Ancestral believers, like my society, believe that the Jill has a connection to the spirit of the river, the land, and the forest. So when Jills are made, they are purified to satisfy the forest for falling the tree to make the instrument. So um, I believe the Jill, he told me, my telephone father told me, the Jill has no uh, date. You can't put a date of its um, beginning onto the instrument because it came alongside with humanity and alongside with the Dagara people. So uh, we, it's really difficult to trace how um, the Jill started with the Dagara people. Mm. Uh, I'm Joe, the uh, vibraphone has, uh, you know, it doesn't have the weight of history, as you said, that, that, that some other c classical instruments have. Um, but it, now it really has an incredible history in America. Uh, as, and, and, and I mean, did you know about that when you started? And, and how did you, you know, how did you deal with that incredible history? That, that the, really cool thing, the really cool thing about the vibraphone was that up until recently, up until 1999, the entire history of the of the vibraphone was every every proponent was alive um, until Mill Jackson and Lionel Hampton passed away. So you almost had you you really had the 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 entire history of the instrument was 
you were living, mm. which was amazing. Lionel Hampton, Milt Jackson, Gary Burton, Bobby Hutcherson, Dave Pike, Terry Gibbs. Um, and Joe uh, Locke. I'll put, I'll put myself in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> although I thought I was going to buy it about 10 days ago when my appendix ruptured in Winnipeg, but that was... But that was uh, so I'm happy to be here. But but a but it was a, a fascinating thing that all the propon all the all, all the people, the history of the instrument was alive on the planet at the same time, and now um, that's not the case anymore. But the vibraphone, um, to me, is, yeah, is an incredibly young young instrument. And one of the cool things for me about playing the vibes is that is that um, there's still a lot of possibilities for, uh, regarding how to how to how to approach it. Um, uh, for me, I. I I play four mallets. I'm always holding four, but a big part of my concept is is that of the two mallet players. I come out of the the experience of the really blues-oriented um, jazz players like Milt Jackson and Bobby Hutcherson, who only hold only held two mallets. So the concept that I have playing Stevens is that, and one of the great things about Stevens' grip for me is that you're holding four, but that you can play with the two inside ones as if you're only holding. So my, my concept is, is, is that basically of a two m mallet player, but whenever I want to add a third note or a fourth note, the mallets are always in my hands. If I, anytime I want to add a cluster or, a, or something quartal or something, something, you know, drop more harmony into the game, you know, it's, I have the mallets in my hands. Um, did, did you get to work with or, um, I mean, I know you've worked with Bobby Hutcherson, but yeah. have you, have you, did you get to work with it or? In, in any sense, either Milt Jackson or Lionel Hampton? Well, I know Milt, um, I, I, I knew Milt, and I, I had, had the honor of, of right after Milt, Milt passed, um, his wife asked me um, um, to do something as a tribute to her husband, and I, I toured with his, with his band for two years with the members of the Milt Jackson Quartet sort of, sort of representing and uh, keeping the legacy of his music alive. I still remember having the experience at the, at the Detroit Jazz Festival of, which was his the town he was from, walking out, walking out on stage and the entire Jackson family was sitting in the front row looking at me like this. <laughs> so I really had to prove myself. Everything worked out okay, but that was one of the most daunting experiences I've ever had in my life. But. Um, the, the, the thing to go back to what you, what you were asking that, that yeah, it's a very young instrument and um, and I think that I think that for a long long time there was really a really lack of, of really young um, players c coming along who were who, who were great vibraphonists and also um, jazz improvisers it's a very difficult instrument to transcend the coldness of it it's a very it's um, you know, to breathe life into the instrument is very difficult, and and um, but now that's really changed, and all of a sudden there's this there's this 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 outpouring of young players who are finally coming along and kind of catching up to the other instrumentalists, to, to the you know the wealth of saxophonists and pianists and trumpet players and guitarists who are they get younger and younger all the time, and or seemingly to me anyway, and and uh, and um, the the intellectual like level of musical understanding and and uh, and musical depth is incredible now the vibe players are catching up to that mm -hmm. and it's it's really heartening to see it you know how, this, yeah I mean how did how did you Lisa how did you approach I mean who were some of your models that you looked to when you were starting out and um, and, and obviously, you know, you, this isn't the only thing you play. You're a percussionist. You play all, all you know, a lot of different instruments. Um, but what what drew you to specialize more in, in the marimba? Because um, I, I know there's a lot of marimba players, also uh, soloists, for example, from Asia, um, Keiko Abe, and many, many great uh, Asian players and composers, many Asian composers who gravitated toward the marimba as well as, a, as an instrument. I think um, I, I have a difficult time answering that just because I, I really think of myself as a percussionist because um, my voice in a way is playing drums and marimba and percussion. Um, but I took a liking to the marimba just because I think um, in music, uh, when something something's very humbling, you, you want to work at it a lot harder. And I found that with the marimba is that it's, it's one of these crafts that you can work on it and work on it, and you never feel 
like it's perfected. And I guess you can you could take that idea with any musical instrument, um, but especially with the marimba, it's so intricate and technically difficult in so many different ways. To get the music to speak the way that it deserves to be spoken is a very difficult task. Um, and I think, in a way, I, I like the work that it takes to kind of get the music to speak the, the way that it needs to be spoken. Um, and I think, in a way, that's why I'm so drawn to the marimba repertoire, which is, it's not very old at all. I mean, if you're, you're talking about the solo marimba repertoire is even uh, probably been around less long than the vibraphone. Yeah. Um, so composers have only recently started to look at this instrument that you're going to hear me play tonight as a solo instrument. Um, most of what they would think of a keyboard instrument you would hear written for in a larger ensemble, like an orchestra um, or a, cha a chamber group. You know, in the 20th century, a lot of composers started to write for percussion as multiple percussion setups in chamber ensembles. Um, and then a lot of composers who are writing new music for orchestras began writing for more um, different sounds, I guess. You know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, all of a sudden you start to get all of these different percussion instrument sounds. But only now are they taking uh, specifically the five octave marimba that you see up here and saying, okay, well we can see now how this can be a solo instrument and how can we get repertoire written for it. And my generation of soloists, um, the people who specialize in this instrument or percussion in general, um, I, myself mostly, one of my life endeavors is to try to commission works for this specific instrument because our repertoire just isn't um, as broad as say the violin or the concert piano. Um, or even some more standardized instruments, like even the clarinet or you know trumpet. You would think that we would have this repertoire, but it's so new. This is like a, a baby, you, you know, in its in its infancy. We're just trying to get more and more pieces written for it by well, really good composers. That's why I'm so lucky tonight to get to play um, a work that Derek wrote. That's never. You know, last night was the first night that it's ever been performed in a concert setting, and Paul's works as well, which is very exciting for me to have works that haven't really been performed that much, and I get to kind of breathe life into them. And, you know, just to get to work with these composers is something that is really special for me, you know, just in a whole life context as well. I, I think one of the cool things about the marimba too. Not I'm, I'm not I, I don't specialize on the marimba. I play it, um, but but um, I think one of the cool things about the, the marimba as a listener is that um, n not only are new works being written for it, but like with the vibraphone, um, it, it it other music translates well uh, to it. Albeit it's difficult to uh, to get together on the instrument. But like Pius Chang, for example, plays Chopin incredibly. You know, you know, Chopin, piano music that's difficult for pianists, he plays on marimba, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Or Nancy playing the bagatelles, the Beethoven bagatelles, you know, which is, which is, which are gorgeous on the instrument. Bach on, on the marimba is, is, is absolutely gorgeous. Lee Stevens, you know, was kind of known for, you know, for playing fugues and, and, uh, and, um, and for playing Bach on the marimba. And, and so it's really, and then I, I can relate to it as a vibraphonist because there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that, that's written for other instruments, but that really speaks well on the marimba and on, on the vibes. Fernando Sor, you know, for, for example, or classical guitar literature um, sounds, sounds really nice on vibes, you know? So it's, it's kind of fun because... You yeah, can and play we always say that if those composers were alive and the instrument that exists today would have existed back then, you know... They'd be writing for yeah, it. Yeah, what, they would love the instrument. They would love to write for it. Well, I think... Um, you know, I, I mean, certainly, I, I was going to ask you, Paul, uh, the, uh, you've been teaching for years, and probably w you've seen a lot of students try stuff that is impractical on these instruments, and then you also talked about your own journey, writing for, uh, learning to write for, for marimba, and, and uh, what do you think, I mean, one of the things I've seen is that a lot of the time people expect mallet instruments to be very loud in an orchestral context, and they're not. Um, they actually, I mean, I find marimbas actually quite soft, and the same thing with the vibe. Um, 
xylophone is another story because it's supposed to kind of pop out there at the top. But that's, uh, I mean, have you, do you have any uh, particular thoughts about what you've seen students do over the years? Uh, I'm using two mics here, so I'm feeling well, quite schizophrenic. Uh, one thing that a lot of, comp not a lot of composers, but one thing that a number of composers have discovered, and I've discovered certainly, is that if you write for percussionists, your music is, is going to get played. And, uh, you know, you're not competing with Beethoven, so it's not a choice of playing the Beethoven marimba. You're only portfolio. competing with Beethoven transcriptions, That's right. as they were saying, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm a little worried about that, actually. <laughs> Maybe we should talk about it. Uh, but the, the fact is that writing for percussion is, is, um, is really an exciting thing. And I've written, you know, a, a handful of percussion pieces, and they get played all the time, and it's really exciting. And percussionists are devoted. I joined Facebook. Uh, recently, and, and I keep getting these requests to be a friend on Facebook, so I look at who they are, and three quarters of them are percussionists. Mm -hmm. wow. They so want to be your friend. Yeah, they want to That be either means friend. they have no friends, or it means, <laughs> right. you know, or it means so they like it, you. Yeah. But, but to answer your question, Derek, um, it's really only the past 10 or 15 years that uh, I think I've seen undergraduate student composers really starting to write for percussion. And now you have one who's a percussionist there right yeah. now, who's terrific, yeah. Uh, David Little. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, no, David, but then there's another guy, too, uh, who's also a percussionist. Oh, Cameron Britt. Yeah, yeah, yeah Cameron, Cameron Britt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we have a bunch of, and I think we have some more, uh, but they're, the, the percussionists tend to be multitaskers, like, uh, as Lisa was saying, you don't just play marimba, <laughs> you, play, you play drums and you play mallet instruments in general. Yeah. So percussionists in general are really versatile people and writing for them is great. And their enthusiasm is just infectious. Yeah, and, and they often, you know, like we're saying, will play, you know, a number of different instruments. You actually have in, uh, Paul, you use uh, some extra percussion with the marimba in your piece. Yeah. Can you tell was, us about that? That was, that was sort of, um, um, and well, the, the, the idea was to write a, uh, a percussion a solo percussion piece, and I decided to make it a marimba piece with additional percussion. And one, one thing that uh, some composers do, there's a composer named Xenakis, who's written a lot of percussion music, but he leaves it up to the percussionist to decide what instruments to play on. And I think that's sort of a cop-out in a way, you know. Uh, it's coming from computer music where I had to orchestrate every detail of the spectrum. It was always interesting to me to decide what what things would be played on. But nevertheless, percussionists know much more than any composer about what's going to work. And so in the piece that Lisa, of mine that Lisa's playing tonight, um, I specify three woods and two metals, and I leave it up to the percussionists to decide which. I just got a video of another player playing the whole suite, and she uses Amglocken. Uh, instead of uh, which like a, a kind Lisa, of a cowbell, yeah, larger, yeah. which is a wonderful sound. Lisa, Lisa uses one of my favorite instruments, a go-go bells, which I, I love. Usually, you, so, you associate them with you know sort of sweaty Latin Cuba, mm -hmm. Cuban uh, bands, and uh, it's a great sound. Uh, so um, I sort of I sort of kind of bought the best of both worlds. I I was able to specify a certain amount uh, of timbre, but I also wanted to use the expertise of the percussionist. And woods are confusing. Cowbell has sort of become a cliche thanks to, what's his name? Uh, more, more cowbell guy? Yeah, more oh. cowbell guy. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. Yeah. Chris Walken? Chris Walken, right. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so whenever I hear cowbell, I think of Chris Walken. <laughs> um, that's inside the mind. That's really ins deep inside the mind of the composer. Uh, do you, do you, are there particular questions that people have? Because I wanted to open it up and give them, give everybody a little break before we, we go on. But are there questions? Come on, come on, guys. Is okay, if you don't, I've got many more. But you know, I'd like to hear from folks out there. Uh, are any of you composers? Ah, I good am, question. I write all the time. Yeah, I write all the time. It's a very important part of who I am. Yeah. Lisa has a beautiful piece that she's playing. And she has yeah. a beautiful piece tonight. Yeah. And so is Bernard. Yeah, yeah. So in other words, all of them. And I think that actually not only what Paul was just saying about percussion is being very attuned to compositional choices because they're, they're, they're often asked to do much more than other players are in terms of 
you know, providing uh, timbral choices. Uh, so I think it, it lead, being a percussionist leads naturally into being a composer. But I also think that, um, you know, I think that it's the nature of these instruments, they're newer instruments, and I think it leads people to want to write for them because the rep is not there already. I mean, if you have Beethoven and you have Bach and you have Mozart and everybody else, you know, then you, and, 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 you know, we, you, you, that's true on the saxophone too. If you've got your Charlie Parker and your John Coltrane and your Sonny Rollins and your, uh, you know, Coleman Hawkins, you, you don't need, you don't feel that need, the burning need. Uh, but when you play these instruments, there might be more of a need in that. And, 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 but of course, being a composer in general is kind of its own need. You, you know, just talking about co composers though, I have great respect for composers. And I, I always say, I write all the time and I've, I've written for large ensemble and small ensemble and, you know, big band writing and, and uh, but I say more, I write songs. And I, le and my, I have friends and colleagues, and someone like Paul, I consider a, com a composer. And I, I think that, um, um, I don't necessarily think that anyone who writes a song, I, I write songs on a regular basis. Does that make me a composer? I don't know. Because I think that there's something deep in, in the way the mind of a composer works, like Paul or f friends of mine like Tim Garland, in the, uh, that's in England, there's a process you go through as, as a composer that I talk to him about a composition and I feel like I haven't scratched the surface of what he's dealing with. And so, so um, um, are you a composer if you write songs? Maybe you're a songwriter if you write songs. If you're a composer, you're, you're, you're taking that process to a, deeper, to a deeper place. So just to put that out there. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that last night as I listened to the three of you play. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, I think the range of what it means to be a composer is really vast, and everyone here is a composer in the sense uh, I'm a specific kind of composer, and you know I write comfortably for Lisa to play things, and but there are things she does I could never imagine writing. When I listened to you play, I had I did a thought experiment. And I said, I wonder if I could write something like that, and and my first reaction was not in a million years, you know, <laughs> I could I you know. I could write, I could, I may write every 50th note, and that would be a tune that I would play, but the, you know, the music you're playing, you're sort of inventing composition on the spot. Yeah. And when I heard Bernard play, uh, the thought was, oh my God, I, yeah. I, I could never, you know, even imagine what it would mean to write that. But then it was interesting to hear him talk about composing and yeah. talk about playing a piece with um, Alarm Will Sound. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, because, because the there, range there are, of what it, yeah. The range of what it means to be a composer is vast, yeah. and I think, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to disagree with you no. in public, but... <laughs> no, no, no. I, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're all composers. You know, I, I, I think a big difference, I, I think one of the things I, I think in composition when I talk to, when I talk to my, my colleagues, like Billy Childs, who's an amazing symphonic composer, and Tim Garland, is, is sometimes I think the difference between a composer and a songwriter is how you, is how the, how the harmony of something emerges. And sometimes I think of a composer as someone, the harmony emerges f through, through counterpoint. Mm. As, as opposed to, as, a, as opposed to, as opposed to me, either who, who writes more, um, would it be vertically, like chord, a chord progression. Mm. Whereas with, with Tim, I see, I see things, I think harmonies emerge as a result of counterpoint that are, that, that don't even have names by, by the nomenclature I know. Um, and, and that's, and there are, um, harmony is you're created through these intersecting lines that are arrived at by a, by, by an intellectual process and a, and a, a heart process and an intellectual process that I can't even begin to, to understand. Well, you know, I'm, I'm teaching an undergraduate course in sort of songwriting at the current moment. And, uh, we've been looking at a couple of songs by Paul McCartney. Yeah. And Paul McCartney is an amazing composer. Yeah, and, totally uh, agree. Uh, what he does with counterpoint and yeah. harmony is... But some of that may be because he's a bass player, too. You know, I mean, yeah, it may have yeah, trickled into yeah. the, that thinking of being a bass player and thinking from underneath, you know. Yeah, the, the, the lower voices of Paul McCartney songs are as, every bit as rich as the tune, and yeah. the integration of the two is just astounding. If, 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 if you talk in that way, too, there's a, the, 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 there are a lot of jazz musicians who look down their noses at pop, people in the pop world, but a lot of jazz musicians have a very, have a very, um, very sort of, uh, it's become sort of tired and predictable actually, although that's changing, of using, you know, harmony from the, from the hum, harmonic progressions from the Great American Songbook, which are actually kind of tired. And if you listen to, to, to writers like, pop, pop writers like Paul McCartney 
or Billy Joel or Peter Gabriel, that they do these, these surprising, surprising kind of jumps in key to get from one place to the other that, that a jazz musician would never th think of doing and that they're, they're actually not only quite sophisticated but, but really fresh. And so when I listen to pop music, I, I sort of laugh and I go, huh, these, there are jazz musicians who look down their nose at these guys because it's rock music or pop music, but really it's very, very creative and, fr and fresh, actually, how they're dealing with harmony. And so oh, yeah. it's... And so, I mean, Stevie Wonder, someone who just comes to mind, is, you know, just writes great he's one, of the few, he's one of the few guys who incorporates the half-diminished chord in pop music. You hear that? Yeah. For the next quiz. Are, are there, are there other, other questions about anything... No, we're, we're covering a lot of ground here, but yeah. What's the difference between the type of music you would write for these different instruments? Uh, like, is it, are they better on one instrument than another? <laughs> well, I've just I've just been working on a piece of vibraphone and guitar. Oh, cool. And uh, the the combination. I wrote another piece of trio with vibraphone. Vibraphone blends beautifully with ensembles. I love the vibraphone and orchestra. I've used vibraphone and orchestra music. And you, uh, you, you were talking about the, 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 the marimba Lin duo. And what's interesting is, I mean, in that, there's obviously that suggests with the violin a lot of bowing. And of course, we're not going to hear bowing tonight, but that's a technique that's used on both marimba and, and vibraphone. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the marimba, uh, these, your question was about combining these instruments. They're different. There are some things, the vibraphone, the, 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 the only big difference, there are some things that, that might sound good on the marimba and the vibraphone. The big difference is that, is that the vibes, is that the vibraphone has uh, a sustain pedal and the marimba doesn't, although it has sustain that you can achieve uh, through rolling. The notes really, once they're played, Although they have some sustain, they're played and they're done. On the, on the vibraphone, it has a sustain pedal, just like a piano, and you can play a note and it's going to ring for a long time. Until I take my foot off the pedal. So that, that's really a difference. The only thing is I wouldn't write something, I might write, write something different for vibes and for the, uh, the marimba, just considering that... Um, that you have the sustain issue, you know? It's you know, sort of a simple answer. It's, it's just because we've been talking about these two instruments and the, and the Jill. Um, Bernard has worked with uh, some other musicians to develop a notational system for the Jill, uh, with, especially with Dave Rogers and Mark Stone, uh, who, are, who are both percussionists. Actually, Dave's a saxophone player, but who also plays pretty good Jill and plays uh, good talking drum, you know? And, uh, and they came up with a system to notate the Jill, which they thought was kind of intuitive. And, and since since then, Bernard, you've been working with symphony orchestras, mm -hmm. groups. It, it, we, they've, they've, they've been kind of taking Bernard's stuff and realizing it on, for larger ensembles. And, and we did a project with the New York Philharmonic that time, um, South Dakota Symphony, where they played your Jill Concerto and you played with a trio. So, so now e even the Jill is kind of making its way into this, uh, uh, into this scenario. But what's interesting is, of course, Along with that comes a whole new system of notation because the scale is different. So, uh, I think it's really cool because it seems like symphony orchestras are are really are really dying to find some new, yeah. some some new Literally. exciting something that, that that's going to just bring people into the into the theaters, you know. And I think that see, seeing you perform solo is exciting enough, but to see to see you as a soloist with a symphony orchestra, I can imagine would just be like wow. You know, so so that's that's good for the symphony orchestras that that that's that's happening because they they need you know it seems like that symphonies are really you know having a hard hard time now. That's one thing, so, something fresh that's going to bring people bring people to the music again. Yeah, that gives me a lot of work. It means I have to I have to rearrange all my songs and uh, change a little bit of how it is perceived in the traditional setting. Because first, when I saw the uh, South Dakota Symphony conductor, this piece. He looked at it and says, orchestra don't sing. Because you and, asked the orchestra to sing. Right. Right. So, and then um, one of the thing, um, comments I got at, after the first uh, concert with the South Dakota Symphony Orchestra was the, the, the force of the rhythm. You know, everybody is really 
asked to put up with this vibrant, rhythmic changes, and you can move it. So when I go to perform with orchestra, um, when I went to perform with New York, uh, I mean, um, South De Minnesota Orchestra, the configuration was, a, was an issue because I was put in front, people at the back could not hear what I was playing, so we have to really think about the setting of how you can put this instrument in to have everybody be part of this new creative yeah. way of playing. So one of the things, the challenges is the rhythmic force and how you can relate that to the other orchestral style of playing. I'm, I'm, I'm just asking this because we haven't had a chance to talk about it. Did you, was, how were things constructed to, were, were Bernard's pieces arranged for orchestra by a third party? Where are they? Are, are they? Are they your orchestrations? Is there a compo Was there another composer, arranger involved? There was. The, well, there's yeah? d this guy Dave Rogers. Uh, I've got this. This guy. That is so cool, Dave, by the way. I know, that's, I know. I'm that's feeling very cool with my lapel <laughs> mic here. Um, this. This. There, there's a guy named Dave Rogers. He's a jazz saxophonist and and has been to Africa uh, several times. And so he, he's worked with Bernard on a number of occasions. Actually, he's been your student too. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and and he and so when this opportunity came up. Uh, Dave arranged uh, the uh, some of took some of Bernard's tunes and worked with you to arrange them a lot because of it work. wasn't just Dave just take it and say okay I'll I'll be back in uh, to, to arrange two them weeks. for symphony orchestra yeah yeah, yeah. it's a but, big undertaking though. yeah well uh, there were a lot of people that had a hand in the first uh, round including me when he yeah. sent me the score and said what do you think of this I said okay here we go yeah. I sent him the Adler orchestration book and then he went back to work but you know it's it's a it's a long process of trying to learn how to. I mean, there's, there's a number of different challenges. It's not only taking the tunes, trying to figure out how to expand them, and, and to, uh, but how does the conductor fit in? What's the difference between a bunch of African musicians who are tuned into each other rhythmically, locking into these rhythms, interlocking rhythms, and a bunch of string players sitting, reading music off a stand? How, does, how do you take the whole vibe of one and transfer it to the other one? And it, I think it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, because the whole concept of making music is so different in an orchestra where people are following a conductor, you know, like a perfect kind of representation of a, uh, an 18th century dictator, you know, uh, transferred and transfer that to this communal way of making music, which is, which is very, very different. They're both beautiful and, ver and very special, but they're, the worlds don't necessarily overlap and cross automatically. So making that transition, which I feel was done brilliantly in this, in this way, but it took a lot of work, it took a lot of thinking of how to, how to combine these worlds. Yeah. And, um, well, are there any other questions, first of all? Just wanted to see, because maybe we can take one more, yeah. Yeah, the question was about tuning uh, and about, about what, how that uh, how, how the jill is has a different tuning than Western tuning. The jill um, has a standard of tuning which supposed to represent the voice of the people. So, like in my culture, um, there are three sub dialects within the larger ethnic group, and we all use the jill. But the tunings are a little bit different from each sub-dialect because um, it is tuned to speak the language of that dialect. Um, intervals, I do not understand what they mean in Western terms, but I believe they're all still five octave uh, scale. Pentatonic scale. Pentatonic yeah. scale. Bernard, you, you told me a story about yes. once how you... You walked up to you. You you, yep. you saw a marimba sitting with the first time when you came to the states. Yes. I think it was in Texas. You were telling yeah, me. You, you, he he walked up to the marimba and he said, and and he was saying, you know, you're telling Mark it yeah. has Mark it has too many notes. I don't know, you know, there's too many notes here in each scale. And then you went, you said, but this way, yeah. now it looks good. Yeah. <laughs> here, right? Because yeah. you've got your. Uh, so then you were ready to play when you yeah. walked to the other side. That's why I keep, um, keep making this vague argument or um, what, why Western musicians or uh, music making should always make an instrument for right-hand players alone. 
Because in my culture, if you are a right hand player, you're supposed to use your dominant hand to do the improvisation, just as all musicians do. If you're a left hand player, you use your left to do your dominant uh, improvisation. So to make a, an instrument just structured for right hand players alone, I think is uh, taking a lot away from the players. He's saying this because he's a lefty. Because I am a lefty. <laughs> Uh, in fact, when I was a child, I would play. I could play the instrument from both sides, and there are two players who could do that in in my culture. And uh, one day, my xylophone uh, father was, said to me that if you want to become a good player, stay at one place. So I chose to I chose to stay on the on the left side because my left hand is very dominant, and that's what I can use to really express myself. It's like playing a drum using a stick. So when I come here and saw an instrument made like this, I'm like. I want to be able to transpose my playing into any of these instruments like the piano, the marimba, or the vibraphone, but they are made for only right-hand players. And the guitar, like Jimi Hendrix, you, you can turn it upside down and yeah. turn it and change the strings, and then it's a left-handed instrument. There you go. But you can't do that with the piano. No, you can't do that with the piano. Because I never, that big I never thought about. I never <laughs> thought of that. In my whole life, I never thought of that, that yeah. the piano is really like a right-handed instrument, yeah, or an instrument is. for right-handed people. Yeah. So flawed, the piano. So many ways. But, uh, well, any, anything else? Otherwise, I'm going to let the musicians uh, rest up a little uh, for, and, no? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.